Hello, welcome back. I hope you all had good parallel sessions. I'm sure a lot of interesting information that you took in. Uh, we'll start with a poll question right now. We want to get your thoughts if we could, if you could all kindly participate for a moment. We'll have a few questions for you for a few minutes. The poll question is, please suggest priority topics to focus on for future discussions and to carry on beyond this forum. So we have a few choices here. You have these for options A, STEM, or STEAM education, B, digital transformation agenda, roadmap and global sharing network for all DMCs, C, preparing for employment or human transformation, D, life cycle and whole of government approaches and policy guidance for holistic education development, and E, harnessing technology to enhance human creativity. So we would really like your input so that we can work on bringing you interesting topics, relevant topics that you would like to discuss or hear about in the future. Appreciate if you can take a moment to fill out, uh, to answer that. And now we have a few more feedback questions. This is more just to see how you've, um, I guess, uh, what you think of the forum so far and all the discussions, parallel sessions uh, that we've brought you in this forum. So the first question is, how satisfied are you with the ninth ISF, International Skills Forum Program. Uh, so again, you have four choices here. Fully satisfied, satisfied, somewhat satisfied, or not satisfied. So if you could, we'd appreciate your thoughts on that. The second question, with the same uh, choices for answers, will you be able to apply the ideas and learnings you acquired to your education-related work and initiatives? Again, if you could choose extremely from extremely relevant, relevant, somewhat relevant, or not relevant. So we'll give you a moment to answer all of those. And I'm seeing, let me just check. I think we have, if, if I can see, well, you're also seeing the answers there uh, on, the, on your screen there from what you've shown. We have quite a close, I guess everything, I, I guess an equal, distrib almost equal distribution here of uh, options in, in the poll question. I think, the first option for STEM or STEAM got a lot of votes as well as coming in, uh, yeah, as well as life cycle and whole of government approaches and policy guidance, as well as harnessing technology to enhance human creativity. So a lot of you are interested to hear about that. Okay, so thank you for participating in that poll. Again, the feedback questions. Let me ask those three questions again to you if you guys could just take a few moments to answer these three feedback questions. The first, how satisfied are you with a ninth International Skills Forum program. You have options there, fully satisfied, satisfied, somewhat satisfied, or not satisfied. The second question for your feedback, please. Will you be able to apply the ideas and learnings you acquired to your education-related work and initiatives? And the third question, what areas do you propose to improve for future International Skills Forums? So the first choice is, uh, the first option, choice of topics. Second is choice of speakers. Third option, log logistics arrangements. Fourth option, ease of registration and access to forum program. Or for if we could also add, we'll ask you as well for other suggestions to improve future ISF. So we leave it to you to give your own feedback or suggestions. We'd highly appreciate your input on this. It really means a lot to us. Thank you so much for taking time out to participate. It will really help as we bring you uh, more discussions in the future. And some of you were asking how to access these videos. I think some had intermittent connection. So uh, we'd like to let you know that these videos are available this week through the homepage. You can just uh, go to the homepage and see the areas for videos. And for the main panel, you just click on each day's agenda and you can access the live streams that we had throughout the days from there. And after this week, we're happy to let you know that all the videos, all the sessions will be available um, through the same event site. So this site that you're on, you can access all sessions. So please do share it with others that you think may be interested and it will be available for one year. So a lot of information there that you can access as you need. I'm sure you all wanna go back to some of the sessions. Maybe you weren't able to attend all. So please do share this with your colleagues or perhaps other teacher students who might be interested, anyone else in the field of education. I've certainly learned a lot. I'm sure you all have too. And there's still a lot more learning. I'd like to introduce now our closing keynote, 
Vicky Colbert, founder and director of Fundación Escuela Nueva. She is a laureate of the first edition of the Yidan Prize for Education Development that was in 2017, as well as a 2013 Wise Prize for Education Laureate. Greetings from Colombia. It is my pleasure and honor to address you in this International Skills Forum. And I know after so many days of analysis uh, and of, of so many research findings and innovations, uh, I wanted to share with you my views from this part of the world, a bit from south to south, from Colombia to other countries in, in South Asia and in Asia. Uh, I come from South America, specifically from Colombia, a middle income country. Uh, this slack region has advanced significantly in access and coverage, but we still have so many problems of quality. So quality is our issue. We still can say in, in a very sad way, uh, we still have more than 40% of children in fourth grade in Latin America do not understand what they read. So this is a big issue, it's reading comprehension. And another aspect of the region that I think it's important for you to know, Latin America, all Latin America, rural areas of Latin America, we don't have connectivity. So we have really have had to do a lot of innovations and to use alternative ways and, and self-paced learning guides to reach students, but we've managed to do it. Uh, I want to share with you uh, a bit the story of, of Escuela Nueva, which means new school. And ironically, it's one of the longest bottom up innovations of the developing world. We started in the, it's a little bit the story of Cinderella, we started in the rural remote areas of Colombia, uh, when Colombia, like the rest of Latin America, didn't guarantee complete uh, primary education. There were so many invisible schools. Our geography, as you can see, because of the mountains, it's very complicated. So there are many invisible schools, usually small, rural, isolated, multi-grade schools. But we had to transform all this complexity into simple manageable action so that any teacher could put in action and put in practice good pedagogy. Most administrative reforms in Latin America are administrative in nature because the country has been going through a lot of, all Latin America has been going through decentralization, but we really to, we wanted to focus on the pedagogy. And what we really wanted to do was a paradigm shift. So actually, we started uh, We started as a local innovation. From the outset, we wanted to, to reach national policy. To reach national policy, we had to design an intervention that was viable technically, viably politically, technically that any teacher could do it. We could not find PhDs in the remote areas of Colombia. So we had to design uh, something that was viable technically, politically, and it was affordable. So I think this is so important, cost-effective and affordable. It started as a local innovation, but I think the most important thing of Escuela Nueva is we shifted the approach uh, to schooling. We shifted the focus on learning from the teacher to the student, encouraging cooperative and collaborative learning among small groups of students. And it promotes flexibility. So students can advance across grades and have individualized and personalized support from the teacher. So we had to design this and we ended up being an example of the school of the future. This is what is so interesting. Uh, so I always say it, it's a bit the story of, of Cinderella. But I think the most important thing is that uh, we had to think systemically from the outset. If we wanted to have changes with the children, we also had to make changes with the teachers, the way of working with the teachers, the way of working with the parents, with the way of working with the administrators. So from the outset, we had to think systemically. So Escuela Nueva, in summary, uh, is a basic education system which integrates curriculum, administrative, 
community and teachers training strategies in a very uh, in a very operational way. The system uh, makes provisions for active learning and civic and has a close relationship to the community and through the parents and incorporates a flexible promotion mechanism adapted to the lifestyle of the rural peasant children. So in this way, we combine cooperative learning personalized learning, a new role of the teacher as a mentor, a facilitator, uh, and somebody that has more time to know their students, because now we have our learning materials that help and support children and teachers. So what I wanted to share is that it can be done. It can be done. It started as a local innovation once the World Bank selected it as a national, as one of the three innovations worldwide that had successfully impacted national policies. We had a lot of countries coming into Colombia, especially also from Asia, from Africa. From Asia, years back, we received uh, visits from the Philippines, from many teachers and a delegation from the Ministry of Education. This was years back. But I think the most interesting uh, and the, uh, was uh, the Vietnamese came years back and uh, they were so interested in the Escuela Nueva model, especially for the rural isolated multi-grade schoolings. Uh, so uh, we took Colombian teachers to Vietnam and we trained them. And at this moment, Vietnam has been implementing Escuela Nueva in all its territory in the rural schools. And a very important uh, Viet, uh, impact study came out of the World Bank. So I think it's important to demonstrate how we can foster and how we can uh, have more South-South collaboration. I think we have so many more similarities and differences. It's much easier to transfer horizontally innovations, usually than from North to South. So I wanted to share this with you in, in this very brief. I know you've been uh, having wonderful discussions. And uh, I think one of the most important things in relation to the meetings you've been having is that uh, also we wanted to share some of the, uh, re, uh, the, let's say the experiences we've been having to bring research findings to practice it has to a big challenge is the interaction between researchers and practice and research provides guidance to practice and practice provides provides feedback uh, so i think this is what we have always tried to do in escuela nueva we started on the ground bottom up i think this is very important we have lessons from it we learn to expand gradually uh, but we have to we also learned that we have to engage all actors that are relevant for innovations to take place and be sustained this is the most important part uh, the reason for the engagement is that you have to create ownership especially of the key actors of change, because without ownership, actors will not be motivated to continue. So this is why uh, for us, Escuela Nueva became more like a pedagogical movement. We wanted to really concentrate on that shift from teacher-centered education to child-centered. Nothing new. All these ideas came to Colombia years back, like the, in most countries, ideas of good pedagogy, of Montessori, of John Dewey. But these ideas came to the elite schools in Latin America. So this is why it's so important, uh, the case of Escuela Nueva, which means new school, uh, because we wanted to put in practice all these wonderful ideas of, of the great pedagogues of the beginning of a century, but we wanted to ensure quality and equity for the most vulnerable children of Colombia. And we demonstrated that it can be done. So I think uh, one of the most important things that we have learned is that yes, we can have, we can improve quality in the most re uh, remote areas of our, of our geography. Uh, but more of the same is not enough. We had to have a paradigm shift from teacher-centered to child-centered. Uh, we also learned that you had to think systemically from the outset. And I think the most important of all is that uh, we learn to demonstrate and have empirical findings supporting innovations all the time. And But one of the most crucial things is partnerships. We learned 
you have to work with governments. We've been working with the government of Colombia and with other governments of Latin America. You need governments to have big impact and coverage. But we also learned to bring other partners and civil society into the picture. We brought in the Coffee Growers Federation. They have been one of the main supporters of Escuela Nueva. Uh, we started as a local innovation and became a national policy. But then we had to create an NGO, our small NGO, Fundación Escuela Nueva. Volvamos a la gente, let's return to the people. It's the last part of the in Spanish. But I think this is so important because we have learned you have to work with governments for big impact and coverage, but for quality and sustainability. We also have learned you need the role of civil society and public partnerships. This is crucial for quality and sustainability. Thank you very much. Very much, Vicky. What an inspiring, hopeful story. No, wonderful to hear this Cinderella story. Uh, thanks for sharing your experiences from South to South. And indeed, partnerships are key to success. So we'll be hearing, I'm sure, more about this that and this mantra of, yes, we can. That's that mindset. From our next spe speaker now, I'd love to introduce you now to our lightning talk uh, to discuss a new generation of thinking with Ms. Clarissa Delgado, who is co-founder and CEO of Teach for the Philippines or TFP. TFP was established to better address the broader twin challenges of high quality teaching and system level change. Now TFP is a nationwide movement that has trained 305 Filipinos and taught close to 90,000 public school students. Clarissa? Hi Mitzi, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for having me today. It is lovely to be virtually in front of you for this inaugural lightning talk segment at the tail end of what has been truly a fantastic week of learning. My brief remarks today seek to answer just one single question. How is my organization, Teach for the Philippines, addressing children's learning during this pandemic? When COVID-19 arrived on our shores in March 2020, we faced the prospect of school shutdowns. Teach for the Philippines mentally prepared ourselves for the worst possible outcome, a lost year. When confronted with this ambiguity, we regrouped and recommitted ourselves to our mission, ensuring excellent and relevant education for all Filipino children. We knew that we needed to rely on our strengths to see our way out of what looked to be a long, dark tunnel. Our strengths are in data and evaluation and in the clarity of our mission. Rely on them, we did. Though we had been partners with many of our communities for several years, we did not want to assume that we knew how they would be experiencing or reacting to a pandemic. We conducted a series of rapid assessment surveys and reworked our strategies from a blank slate. Based on the surveys, we identified three critical pillars of our pandemic response. Deepen our investment in parents, continue with our partnership with ID Insight, and physically deploy our teachers. These three vital decisions made all the difference and have enabled me to speak in front of you today with a humble measure of success. I will share with you five key lessons we learned from the past year and how with the help of 1,500 parents, we ensured learning continuity for close to 10,000 public school students. As brief context before I begin, Teach for the Philippines is a partner of the Department of Education and works with public school teachers in under-resourced schools all over the archipelago. Our teachers have anywhere between zero to 20 years of experience. On top of their regular national teaching load, our teachers teach and implement Teach for the Philippines designed literacy, numeracy, and life skills programs. In this presentation, I will speak specifically about these literacy, numeracy, and life skills programs because this is what was evaluated by ID Insight. Our organization has spoken and published about our work openly this year, most recently in writing Chapter 6 in ADB's Open Source Book on Learning Societies last May, and in a joint ADB event called Frontlining Education on June 26. My first lesson is meeting communities where they are. As mentioned, we made no assumptions on how everyone would deal with an unprecedented pandemic and surveyed our communities from scratch. The data gleaned from the survey enabled us to adapt our numeracy, literacy, and life skills modules to suit different learning modes, for example, synchronous, bichronous, or modular. 
Additionally, given our detailed knowledge of what was available in each of our partner communities, again, thanks to our early and rapid assessment surveys, we were able to plan ahead to offer our teachers and parents site-specific resources like data allowance, learning kits, printed workbooks, or recorded sessions. Number two, bridge the technology and skills gap. Linked to the first lesson, our second lesson speaks about building in additional time for training support to our teachers, providing training in program administration, materials development, or video production. For ultimate success at the end line, it is critical to consider the readiness and capacity of individual communities to participate in your program and where needed to provide appropriate reinforcements. Recognizing diversity. Recognizing diversity is an especially important part of working in an archipelago of 7,600 islands, 110 million people, and 170 languages, but it is no less important than any other country. Needs vary per community. On the ground, we made sure that our selected teachers were enabled and equipped with the leadership skills and critical thinking skills needed to individualize our program. They localized for language and culture, as some examples amongst many. Proximity matters. Even if under modular distance learning, in our experience, a teacher's presence matters to learning outcomes. In a somewhat controversial realization, we knew from before the school year even began that we could not conduct all our teaching online. There was a massive component of our work that required proximity to our communities. Thus, we physically deployed all of our teachers. To protect our teachers as frontliners, we got them private healthcare packages and up to three sessions with our counseling partners, Child Fam Psychosocial Services. Despite our best efforts, Teach for the Philippines was not immune to COVID. Out of our team of approximately 120, we have recorded 10 cases of COVID. Thankfully, all have recovered. This said, even if our direct employees had systems of support that we could provide, this did not spare indirect families and communities from the brunt of this pandemic. We've lost parents, siblings, husbands, wives, and principals to COVID. In this, counseling truthfully has been critical in keeping our heads above water. We will be deploying our teachers again this year. Right now, our focus is on getting them all vaccinated before deployment a commitment to measurement and to recommit as needed. Even in a pandemic and against almost all advice, we continued our work with international third-party evaluators, ID Insight. We believed that even if we risked results that showed learning loss, we still had two critical commitments to, offer to our students that were of absolute paramount importance above all, growth and accountability. I am pleased to share our results. In literacy, students showed improvement across all four domains that we monitor. Letter names improved from a baseline average of 47% to an end line of 71%. Letter sounds improved from a baseline of 17% to an end line of an average of 55%. Phonemic awareness improved from a baseline average of 37% to an end line of 71%. And invented words improved from a baseline average of 17% to an end line of 53%. In numeracy, students went from answering one out of five competencies correctly to an end line of four out of five correctly answered. 50% of our students we measured answered all five competencies correctly at their end line survey. For life skills, the qualitative interviews showed improvement of leadership and social emotional skills across both students and parents. I remember distinctly a student sharing that he now adds pa or Filipino for not yet, to the end of a sentence when describing skills he is working on. This to us demonstrates a shift to growth mindset. I also remember parents who despite not graduating from schools themselves shared that they've learned to do breathing exercises when they need to calm down, that they've learned to create open forums with their children to open up lines of communication and to check in on each other, and yet others who talked about the dawning realization that positive encouragement was far more effective in helping their children learn during the pandemic. As I come to the end of my brief lightning, lightning talk, I'll highlight two final points. We share our knowledge and learning with the Department of Education. We work closely with their research and their training arm, the National Educators Academy of the Philippines. In fact, we've run sessions that have reached over 6,000 teachers. 
And finally, what I want you to take away from my afternoon presentation is a, a message of hope from our organization to you. Learning can happen. And with commitment and clarity, learning will happen, no matter the odds. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Clarissa. You always inspire, inspire me greatly. I remember when I interviewed you back in 2017, that was for CNN Philippines feature on your work. I was greatly inspired by you and your team's work and I even joined your volunteer program for teachers. And that was a life-changing experience for me. And it is wonderful to see how you have pivoted during this time. Thank you for all you do for us, for the country. And I get sorry also for the losses that you guys had to go through, but thank you for bringing us this hope and uh, continuing to inspire us. All right, so let's move on now for some closing remarks from uh, Ahmed Saeed, who is Vice President Operations 2 at ADB. He is responsible for overseeing ADB's operations in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Thank you so much. Um, and it's uh, truly a delight to be here um, uh, with the uh, bittersweet privilege of formally closing uh, the Ninth International Skills Forum uh, on the theme, Reimagining Education and Skills Development uh, for a New Normal. As, as is well known to uh, our virtual audience, uh, this is the first time that we've done a virtual uh, version of this event. Um, but in fact, while doing this forum in a virtual event presents great challenge, it of course also presents opportunity uh, because we are not constrained by time, travel, or other logistics. And as a consequence, I think uh, I want to commend the organizers uh, for putting together an event which has greatly expanded reach with more experts, policymakers, practitioners, researchers, and academicians from across the world. In fact, if we look at attendance numbers, uh, the number of attendees at the 8th International Skills Forum, which was an in-person event, was 400. Uh, for this event, we had 5,000 people registered and 3,000 joining different sessions over the five days. So that's quite a remarkable uh, expansion of uh, the event's reach. Uh, and I think that is a function of our move into an online and digital world. Um, I want to thank particularly uh, the participants about 80% of those from Southeast Asia, a little bit less than 10% from South Asia, a little bit less than 5% from East Asia, um, and close to 2% from the Pacific, Central and West Asia, and the rest of the world. I wanna thank our participants for uh, participating in our uh, daily poll feature. And we had some very interesting results. Uh, over 50% of participants identified digital infrastructure as the number one barrier for effective digital learning in their country followed by 20% identifying effective government policy and strategy for digital transformation, 14% uh, identifying teacher readiness as the biggest barrier. Uh, in a separate poll, over 50% of participants indicated that their country and skill systems are hardly or not at all prepared for the future of skills and jobs in the context of technology disruption. And 40% identified teacher readiness for digital education and companies for IR 4.0 as the most critical challenge to higher educational institutions, followed by a lack of resources and capacity. And of course, 11% noting that outdated curriculums have not kept up with the job market. Now, all of these challenges that are identified in these polls and otherwise, um, all of them are happening against the backdrop of a horrible pandemic. And the forum, of course, as a consequence, noted on the transformational role that technology is reshaping in how learning for all and equity can be scaled up. I want to uh, congratulate the organizers for a meticulously conceptualized sequence and structured event. 29 sessions, 100 speakers, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of insight, a wealth of wisdom. Um, and I think some of the, the, the key echoes uh, that reverberated through sessions include the importance of going back to basics to improve teaching and learning while also investing in the future in innovative and transformational solutions. Uh, I thought I'd next just review uh, some of the key highlights of these remarks. Uh, the opening remarks and keynote addresses on the first day, I think set the tone in a very powerful way by outlining the opportunities for reimagining education in an age made uncertain by technological disruption. Uh, there was a very interesting panel on the power of convergence, um, highlighting a subject that 
uh, I have always found fascinating, which is the research on brain science and psychology, showing how the future of teaching and learning can be transformed and how education technology can facilitate this transformation uh, by embedding methodologies in a better understanding of the human mind, how it operates, how it learns, how it grows, how it evolves. Uh, the parallel sessions that followed explored how other sectors, including gender, digital infrastructure, agriculture, and health, interface with education and skills development to prepare the future workforce. On days two, three, and four, we took a deep dive in exploring transformational opportunities to reimagine school education, TVET, and higher education. Today's plenary panel discussion and the parallel panel discussion highlighted the importance of developing quality teachers, a theme that echoed through the days of the session, whose role is changing in providing quality education, bringing insights from different disciplines, and promoting 21st century skills, including, of course, digital skills. The focus was on the changing role of teachers and how to support them in actively addressing the learning crisis and achieving our common shared objective of teaching and learning equity. We may recall the concept of growth mindset from Dr. Carol Dweck on day one, how teachers can exercise a growth mindset against fixed mindset practices to make a significant difference in the lives of their students. When teachers show interest in their students' learning, when teachers are interested in their students' learning, when they are determined that everybody can learn, while at the same time, they are capable of providing individual support to those who need it and are able to use the tools and technology and resources available to facilitate that, then our children thrive, become better learners and become what we ultimately all hope for them, better versions of ourselves. Today's regional meetings provided a wonderful opportunity to seek feedback on ADB's initial education framework. The main objective of the proposed framework is to support ADB's developing member countries to improve learning for all. In this context, I would like to reiterate the emphasis placed by my colleague, Vice President Susan Tono, uh, on a two-pronged approach to improving learning and equity. This was something that he stated in his opening remarks. The need to go back to the basics, of strengthening foundational learning and reducing skill mismatches while again taking a transformational approach to scaling learning and equity at all levels of education. I'd like to also recall the three C's that Vice President Susan Tono emphasized to make education systems more dynamic and responsive, convergence, cohesion, and collaboration. Conversion emanates from interdisciplinary approaches to lay the foundation of learning at an early stage to allow everyone to learn at all levels of education and apply their skills better so that they can thrive in their personal, professional, and social lives so they can thrive as complete human beings. Cohesion is what the key stakeholders in the education sector need to work closely in order to reap the benefit of convergence in different contexts, from research to practice at a wider scale. It helps all key players to work in harmony with a united goal. Collaboration is how education and skills development impact other sectors and thematic concerns, since education is, as we all know, the greatest enabler and the greatest equalizer known uh, to humanity. The Skills Forum showcased several examples, such as gender and education, workforce development for health and care industry, digital transformation of priority sectors, and entrepreneurship and sustainable development in the agribusiness value chain. Let me just close by saying it's my sincere hope that you all enjoyed this ninth International Skills Forum. Thank all of you, each and every one of you, for your active participation and the contributions you have made to this forum, to the contributions you have made uh, to the work of the ADB, but even more to the contributions you have made to the education of the children of our region. Um, thank you for persisting uh, in these objectives and this critically important priority in the face of a pandemic uh, that threatens the health of teachers and activists and children, all of us. Uh, we're looking forward to building on these discussions we're looking forward to incorporating the insights and lessons from this forum in our work at the ADB in sharing these insights with our developing member countries and with stakeholders. We're looking forward to organizing the next International Skills Forum, where it is my sincere hope that we will hit the same attendance targets that we hit this one or higher, but that we will do it in a more physical and in-person format. Um, because like learning, uh, forums like this will never ever replace direct human contact in the virtual format. So we are certainly looking forward to seeing all of you uh, in person, safe and healthy uh, next year. And with that, let me draw this session to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ahmed. And thank you to you and your team for bringing this to us despite the challenges 
indeed, we have really gained a lot from this. I have learned a lot from this. And especially in these times of fear, uncertainty, divisiveness all around us, it is so important to have discussions like this and to continue doing this, to continue learning, as everyone has said in this panel. And I recently came across this quote from Confucius that I saw a long time ago, but it applies to what's happening. I guess why stuff like this is important, that education breeds confidence, confidence breeds hope, and hope breeds peace. And definitely we need peace right now. Uh, to, uh, and everything we've learned at this forum helps us, as Ahmed said earlier, to become better versions of ourselves. So we hope this forum has reignited your passion for education. Thank you to all of you for participating in the ninth International Skills Forum. Let's do our best to build a better normal, be safe and be well, and have a great weekend ahead.